So welcome to room three of the uh, 2022 Searcy Regulatory Science Summit. My name is Jason K. Sello, and I'm a professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry in the School of Pharmacy at the University of California at San Francisco. I have the privilege today of co-moderating this session with Dr. Ann Wojcicki, who is a co-founder and CEO of 23andMe, a leader in helping the public uh, appreciate how our genomes reflect our past and influence both our present and future. Um, so within our shared humanity, there are differences and they do matter. Those differences can be correlated with or can yield disparities in many aspects of life. Unfortunately, those disparities can be especially apparent in medicine. Epidemiologists are shining light on how disparities influence rates of morbidity, death, and drug responsiveness. Their data are now informing treatment decisions, clinical trials, and drug development strategies. So today we will hear about resources from the federal government, the FDA in particular, that are available to address health disparities and the groundbreaking work of three epidemiologists on health disparities. First, we hear from Rear Admiral Sharde Araujo, Associate Commissioner of the Minority Health and, um, Minority health and Director of the FDA Office of Minority um, uh, Health Equity, um, and her colleague, Christine Lee, who is a Strategic Research Engagement Lead within the FDA Office of Minority Health Equity. Um, they will talk about resources at the FDA. Then we will hear from Professor Esteban Burchard, Professor of Bioengineering at UCSF, who will talk about how precision medicine um, needs to be more socially precise. Then we will hear from John Jackson, Assistant Professor of Epidemiology uh, at the Bloomberg School of Public Health at the Johns Hopkins University, who will talk about quantifying disparity. And finally, we will hear from Kathleen Liu, uh, Professor of Medicine at UCSF, who will talk about one source uh, towards rapid development, um, rapid, efficient, and unbiased data collection using COVID as a, a, a case example. Hi, I'm Rear Admiral Sharde Orojo, the Associate Commissioner for Minority Health and Director of FDA's Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. It's a pleasure to be here with you today to highlight some of the work that we do to address health disparities and, of course, our efforts to partner to advance health equity. And I'm also excited to be joined today by Dr. Christine Lee, who's the Strategic Research Engagement Lead within the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. By way of background, the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity was established at FDA in 2010, and we work to protect and promote the health of racial and ethnic minority and tribal populations by focusing our efforts on research and outreach and communication that works towards addressing health disparities. And of course, our ultimate goal is to advance health equity. Our office sits within the office of the commissioner. We work broadly across the agency, as well as with both public and private sector stakeholders. And as I mentioned, we focus our work in two key areas. Our research and collaboration program aims to advance minority health and health equity focused research. And Christine's gonna talk more about this in just a moment. Um, by way of background, we support intramural as well as extramural research. We participate in a range of research opportunities across our agency. And of course, that includes the FDA Centers of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation or CIRCES. Um, and we also support internships and fellowships. We always wanna be able to continue to provide training in the space of health disparities. And we have broad stakeholder engagement to advance our research agenda. Our outreach and communication program aims to improve FDA's communications with the populations that we serve. And we do this by supporting a variety of culturally and linguistically tailored programs, initiatives, and campaigns. And one of our most long-term and notable campaigns is a part of our diversity and clinical trials initiative. And I'm gonna talk more about that in just a moment. We also have our language access program where we work to ensure that across our agency, our centers and offices have flexible means to acquire translation services. And we also work to ensure that across all of the tools and resources that we develop, that they're provided in multiple languages to meet the needs of our diverse consumers. We develop health education materials on diseases and conditions that disproportionately impact minority populations. We engage in social media outreach. We have a newsletter. We have a dedicated website that houses all of the information that I'm sharing with you today. And we also host a health equity lecture series. And this is where we hold webinars and bring experts in the space of minority health and health equity so that we can share information not only with FDA, but also with the public. And hopefully what you're hearing me say is that we really work to make sure that we have diverse means and mechanisms to meet the needs of our diverse consumers. Another area that's very important for us, of course, anyone working in the space of health disparities knows 
that we cannot do this work alone. So collaborations and partnerships are critical to achieve our mission. A key priority area for our office that crosses both of our programmatic areas is working to advance racial and ethnic minority participation in clinical trials. And we have our diversity in clinical trials initiative, which includes an ongoing multimedia public education and outreach campaign that works to raise awareness and address some of the barriers preventing diverse groups from participating in clinical trials with culturally and linguistically tailored tools and resources. Um, you see some of these tools and resources listed here. We have our clinical trial diversity fact sheet, brochure, infographic, as well as a dedicated website that houses a wide variety of information that provides education on the needs for diverse participation in clinical trials. Of course, through all of the work that we do within our office, it's critically important for us to have stakeholder engagement. And you see some of, some of the groups that we engage with listed here. This is by far not an all-inclusive list. We are always working to make sure that we are engaging broadly to the, address the needs of our diverse populations. Another way in which we engage is, of course, through social media. Um, and with our social media, we are, of course, highlighting different key themes and messages but we also want to link back to where you can find additional information. And one of the ways in which we do that is linking back to health education materials. Um, this is an example of some of the health education materials that we have. Um, this example is providing our resource, resources on diabetes. So for example, we have our brochure, fact sheet, infographic, um, and we have a wide variety of other health education materials available on our website. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Christine to talk about our research and collaboration program. Christine. Thank you so much, Admiral Rojo. I'm now gonna go into the research and collaboration program. The Office of Minority Health and Health Equity Research and Collaboration Program is a data-driven scientific strategy to advance health equity. We focus on three major impacts, the health disparity impact, the regulatory impact, and the scientific impact. Some examples, and these are just brief examples of the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity Research and Collaboration Program includes supporting fellowships. For example, with NIH, NHGRI, the National Human Genome Research Institute. OMHHG and NHGRI have a postdoctoral fellowship in genomic science and health equity. Additionally, we partner with our sister agencies, such as the VA, to understand real-world evidence and artificial intelligence. We have partnerships with the Hepatitis B Foundation to understand barriers to hepatitis B clinical trials. We have projects that look into social media to listen for patient perspectives on chronic pain. And we have most recently our RFA for Innovation Award COVID-19 and Health Equity. And of course, we have our partnerships with the CIRCES. For example, one of the projects highlighted here is integrating patient and consumer generated discursive data to inform and enhance FDA One Health Initiative communication strategies. I'll also be highlighting another CIRCE project in the next slide. This is our most recently published CIRCE project with Dr. Esteban Bouchard. This project looked into the association of blood parameters and asthma subtypes with asthma outcomes and examined population-specific eligibility for biologic therapies in minority pediatric populations. As you can see, this is our most recent publications with the CIRCE in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. I also wanna highlight a few of OMHHE's Office of Minority Health and Health Equity extramural COVID collaboration and research projects. Such projects include utilizing big data, machine learning, and approaches to increase understanding of COVID-19 among minority populations. Additionally, projects look into leveraging community engagement and electronic healthcare record strategies to promote diverse participation in COVID-19 clinical trials. Additional projects include collaboration with Howard University to understand barriers for African and Asian American participants in clinical trials, as well as creating culturally competent messages. Other projects include our collaboration with the VA to explore the use of real-world data to generate real-world evidence to support COVID-19 treatment outcomes among racial and minority 
racial minority groups. I'm now gonna turn it back to Admiral Orojo. Thank you, Christine. I also wanted to take a moment to highlight one of our most recent initiatives, and this is our Enhanced Equity Initiative. Our Enhanced Equity Initiative really highlights our continued dedication uh, to support projects and communication resources that work to advance equity in clinical trials by continuing to support efforts to advance diversity in clinical trials, also focused on equitable data efforts by increasing data available in the populations that we serve, and of course, equity of voices, where we are continuously working to amplify FDA's communications with diverse groups, um, including consumers, and make sure that they are informed about FDA's efforts, and also to make sure that we continue to understand diverse patient perspectives, preferences, and unmet needs. And finally, I wanna highlight that under our Enhanced Equity Initiative, we're really excited about a funding opportunity that we announced. And this is our COVID-19 and Health Equity Innovation Award. We're really looking at ways that we can continue to advance understanding of racial and ethnic minority participation in COVID-19 clinical trials and ways that we can understand barriers to participation, as well as proposals that are looking at the evaluation of outcomes by demographic data, including but, but not limited to ethnicity, race, disability, and geography. Um, we also are supporting proposals under this innovation award that are looking at COVID-19 research to help us understand diverse patient perspectives, preferences, and unmet needs. Thank you very much for the opportunity to highlight work across the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. Our contact information can be found here. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Esteban Gonzalez Richard. I'm from the University of California, San Francisco. Today, my talk is titled, Making Precision Medicine Socially Precise. I study asthma. I'm a pulmonary expert, and I'm an expert in genetic epidemiology. And one of the things that's most fascinating about asthma is the tremendous racial and ethnic disparities. These are current data from the United States, uh, looking at prevalence on the left, mortality on the right, and you can see that asthma prevalence is highest in Puerto Ricans at 37%, lowest in Mexicans at 8%, intermediate in, in whites or Caucasians at 12%. When we look at mortality rates, we see the same trend. But what's fascinating is 95% of all NIH research has focused on whites over the last 30 years. So I've made it my mission to better understand this paradigm. Asthma is a fascinating disease, it's, it's complex. There are many different, what we call pathobiological or overlapping endotypes, or in plain English, different flavors of asthma. So even though we have this group umbrella of asthma, there's allergic asthma, there's asthma based on lung function, there's high uh, force expiratory nitric oxide asthma, there's high eosinophil asthma, and all of these require different therapeutic treatments. Well, we have collected the largest study of minority children in the United States with and without asthma. And what we've demonstrated is that there are population differences in asthma endotypes, and that these play a role in different asthma disparities. So I have three bins here. I have Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, and African-Americans. The majority of Puerto Ricans in the United States have moderate or severe asthma, whereas the majority of Mexicans in the United States have mild asthma. African Americans have a mix of moderate, severe, and mild. On the bottom graph, we have different peripheral blood parameters. And what we demonstrated here is that Puerto Ricans tend to have a flavor of asthma that has high IgE levels, whereas African Americans uh, and Mexicans have lower levels of IgE. And this is very important because this is how we make treatment decisions. And there are a set of guidelines on how to treat asthma that are made and recommended for all physicians around the world. And it's a step up guidelines. So step one being mild to moderate asthma, step five being severe asthma. And, and you can see here, that we have recommendations for the types of medications that we give for moderate to severe asthma. And I've highlighted it here that the guidelines have changed over the last few years. 
Here we have the NAEEP guidelines as of 2020. We have the GINA guidelines as of 2021. All these guidelines are suggesting adding biologics for moderate to severe asthma. Well, there are different flavors of asthma, as I was already mentioned, and there are different subtypes. So we have type two re responsive asthma, which is steroid sensitive, that is characterized by high numbers of eosinophils, high numbers of neutrophils. There is non-type two responsive steroid insensitive asthma that uh, is characterized by persistent wheeze, airway remodeling. There are new drugs out there, some blockbuster drugs, current biologic therapies for allergic asthma, including Zolair or omalizumab, eosinophilic asthma, including dupixin or dupilumab, and Nucala, Sinquare, Fosserna. But then all these medications are based on biologic blood parameters. What we demonstrated, and we just published this in the Journal of Allergy, Clinical and Immunology this past year, that these biologic parameters differ by race and ethnicity. And based upon biologic parameters, we demonstrated that at least for anti-IgE therapy, a significant proportion of Puerto Ricans do not qualify shown there in the, the orange bar, about 25% do not qualify for anti-IgE therapy, whereas about 20% of African-Americans do not qualify. Now, for the new blockbuster drug, dupilumab, 50%, 5-0% of African-Americans do not qualify based on peripheral blood counts of eosinophils, 27% of Puerto Ricans do not qualify for the medication based on peripheral blood eosinophil accounts. So to me, this is a wake up call that current and future asthma therapeutic studies must be done in patients of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds, or we're gonna simply redo what we've done in the past for the last 50 years is study whites, develop drugs for whites, and, and not develop drugs that are generalizable to non-whites. I wanna say thank you for your attention. I wanna thank my collaborators and my mentors, Neil Risch, my collaborators, Louisa Burrell, Jennifer Larway, uh, and I wanna thank my entire team and the Sandler Family Foundation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is John Jackson. And I'm an assistant professor of epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Today, I want to talk to you about measuring disparity in empirical research. Often in studying social differences and outcomes, one may adjust for certain covariates. My main point here is that statistical adjustments often reflect value judgments. So it's important to be careful in what we adjust for when we're measuring disparity. I realize that today we are and should be interested in what effects policies and interventions have on disparities. But out of interest of time, I just wanna focus on the issue of measuring disparity, which is the first step towards this goal. In this recent paper of mine, I discuss not only these issues of measuring disparity, but also issues of causal inference. So I encourage you to read it if you find these ideas interesting and wanna explore them further. It is a technical paper, but in the middle of the paper, I elaborate on the principles and value judgments that I'll uh, talk about today. One example of causal inference is the following thought experiment. Say we observe outcomes for a marginalized group, for example, black persons in the US context, and say we observe outcomes for a privileged group, for example, say white persons in the US context. And then we ask what would outcomes for the marginalized group be if treatment were distributed differently? For example, what if we removed the disparity in treatment? What would the disparity in outcomes be? If we could estimate the answer to this question, we could compare observed outcomes for the marginalized group versus 
the observed outcomes for the privileged group, which would give us the observed disparity, the observed outcomes versus the counterfactual outcomes for the marginalized group, which would give us the reduced disparity and the counterfactual outcomes for the marginalized group versus the observed outcomes for the privileged group, which would give us the residual disparity. Together, these quantities tell us how much our hypothetical intervention of removing disparities in treatment might reduce disparities in outcomes. The key here is that causal inference revolves around treatment rather than the group to which a person uh, belongs or is assigned. All of this presupposes a definition of disparity for health outcomes, but how do we measure disparity in health outcomes? In the bioethics literature, it's not necessarily assumed that a raw or crude or unadjusted difference equals disparity. Paula Braidman's definition, which was used in the Department of Health and Human Services Healthy People Report, which built off of the work of Margaret Whitehead and uh, her work at the World Health Organization, um, says that disparities are systematic and avoidable differences that adversely affect disadvantaged groups. This definition emphasizes that disparities need not be established causally, however. The fact that a historically oppressed group is further disadvantaged on health is enough uh, to think of these as unfair based on the principle of human rights. Now, this definition introduces the concept of allowability. And we can think of allowable sources of difference as those that we might consider to be fair, uh, that do not contribute to unjust difference, and that we would want to adjust for to take their contribution off the table when we measure disparity. Uh, whereas we would think of non-allowable sources as ones we might consider to be unfair that do contribute to unjust difference uh, that we would not want to adjust for so that we could keep their contributions on the table when we measure disparity. So how do we choose what's considered allowable? Uh, the bioethics literature and public health offers some principles. Uh, two of those principles are manipulability and amenability to intervention. So manipulability says that factors that a responsible actor has no control over might, con might, con might be considered as allowable. Uh, and amenability to intervention says that non-manipulable factors uh, that have addressable effects uh, might be considered to be allowable, especially if they adversely affect the socially marginalized group. So for example, um, if we think about age and whether or not we should consider it to be allowable, um, we know that age usually predicts worse health outcomes. It's not manipulable, but it has addressable effects. But in the US context, black persons are often younger than white persons. And so age differences do not uh, disadvantage black persons with respect to outcomes. Therefore, we could treat age as allowable and adjust for it so as um, to reflect these principles. And also more broadly, um, adjusting for age uh, avoids attenuating um, and avoids masking, measure, um, masking disparity. Um, and what about clinical factors or comorbidity and socioeconomic status? Well, we know that comorbidity and low socioeconomic status predicts worse health outcomes um, and they may or may not be manipulable at, at the point of care. Um, but in the US context, black persons often have um, more comorbidities and lower socioeconomic status. Um, and so these differences disadvantage black persons with respect to outcomes. Thus we could consider these to be non-allowable and not adjust for them so that they do contribute to disparity. So remember in our thought experiment, we envision removing disparities in treatment how do we measure disparities in treatment decisions? Uh, we have some guidance from the health services research literature. Uh, like um, the bioethics literature in public health, it does not equate racial difference with disparity. A uh, definition from what used to be called the Institute of Medicine defines disparities in care as uh, those that are not due to differences in access to care, clinical needs, or preferences for care. And I put asterisks by uh, access and preferences because these are often uh, these are often debated. In any case, I believe the IOM criteria implicitly reflect the principle of social contract, um, which says that criteria that society has agreed should 
ideally govern how uh, uh, a good is distributed should be considered allowable. So in medicine, it's critical that treatment decisions are clinically appropriate and clinical guidelines are often adapted for age and clinical status. So it makes sense to treat these factors as allowable and, and to adjust for them. Um, but clinical guidelines do not base treatment decisions on socioeconomic status and as it's not clinically relevant. So it makes sense to treat socioeconomic status as non-allowable and not adjust for it, again, so it would contribute to disparity. Now, some treatment decisions, like say organ allocation are more complex uh, because they involve the distribution of scarce resources. In these cases, uh, even if we came up with a social contract that we all might agree might represent a fair decision, uh, the overall allocation at the population level may be unfair as uh, it may place a burden on an already marginalized group. Uh, that is, the allocation may be unfair uh, in that there may be that's um, that there may be disparities in the criteria themselves, um, thus to reflect um, this broader issue of, uh, pop of, 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 of treatment allocation at the population level it might make sense to treat the criteria as not allowable and to not adjust for them so that uh, disparities in these factors uh, contribute to um, disparity in allocation. In my own work, I've built in allowability designations into measures of disparity. And I've chosen a descriptive measure. It's not a causal effect of race or a causal effect of intervening on the allowables. Uh, rather, it's just a descriptive measure that adjusts for allowables through a uh, form of direct standardization. And I made this choice on ethical grounds that disparity should be easy to measure so that it can assist uh, social justice efforts. Um, so this measure is descriptive and as such, it can serve as the basis for causal inference on how actions or hypothetical actions may change disparities. So today I've focused on choosing which covariates to adjust for and measuring disparity. And ultimately, uh, to me, this choice reflects value judgments um, or it can reflect value judgments. Previous literature has highlighted many other value judgments when measuring disparity, but the choice of what to adjust for is a critical one uh, because it determines what disparity measures pick up and what they do not. As two examples from the COVID-19 pandemic illustrate, this is not an academic issue. Uh, many studies of racial difference in inpatient mortality treated socioeconomic status, pre-existing conditions, and geography as allowable, even when racial and ethnic minorities were disadvantaged on these factors. Again, um, adjusting for these factors took their contribution off the table uh, when measuring disparity. In another example uh, raised by Calgary and colleagues, uh, the Centers for Disease Control provided weights that adjusted for geography. And this downweighted areas where the pandemic was raging, raging where racial and ethnic minorities often live. And, and doing so made the resulting disparity smaller. And again, those disparity measures did not pick up the contribution of racial residential segregation to disparities in COVID-19 mortality. So I'd like to close with an analogy for practice. Uh, we built a culture in epidemiology that values laying out its assumptions about how the world works vis-a-vis -vis through a causal graph. This helps us communicate with one another and helps guide our analytic decisions. In the same way, we can build a culture where we lay out our value judgments um, to help us communicate with one another and make sound analytic decisions when measuring disparity. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present today on one source towards rapid, efficient, and unbiased data collection. Before I can tell you about one source, I need to tell you about the iSpy COVID clinical trial. This is a clinical trial that we stood up early last year uh, to identify novel therapies for patients with severe COVID-19 defined as hospitalized patients with a WHO COVID level five or higher. That's more than six liters of oxygen. These patients received a standard therapy uh, backbone, which includes from Desiree and dexamethasone. And then the protocol uh, is a master protocol that can include up to four agents in the trial at any time. In addition to the clinical trial protocol, there's a real world observational arm to the study, uh, which enrolls patients who are ineligible or declined consent. This is a phase two trial with the goal of identifying large signals uh, with a primary uh, endpoint of time to durable COVID level four uh, or uh, a co-primary endpoint of mortality. 
This is an adaptive Bayesian statistical design enrolling 50 to 125 patients per graph. This study started at the original I spy breast uh, site, but has very rapidly grown. As of uh, this week, we have 32 sites activated and enrolling. And you can see from this map uh, that the sites sort of encompass a wide uh, geography of the United States, as well as a variety of different types of healthcare settings. There are both academic medical centers such as UCSF, Penn, uh, Wake Forest, um, but there are also um, uh, regional healthcare systems, including Kalispell and Sanford Health, um, as well as other community settings such as Long Beach Memorial. So in addition to um, successfully um, uh, bringing on a number of sites, we've enrolled uh, many patients in both the observational randomized study. You can see from this graph, for example, that our enrollment um, very much paralyzed parallels the waves of the of uh, the epidemic as we've seen them so far. And unfortunately, you can see that with Omicron, we are seeing an uptick uh, in uh, uh, our uh, enrollment as well, even though we think this may be a less severe variant. So the iSpy clinical trials presented a number of great opportunities and challenges for us. So obviously some of the opportunities include the unprecedented focus and energy devoted to COVID-19 treatment. And this has occurred from many different arenas, uh, clinicians, uh, the pharma industry, the FDA, as well as patients and families. Um, uh, we are very grateful to the connection between Carolyn Calfee and Laura Esserman. Uh, this established connection really allowed us to roll this study out quickly um, and to really take advantage of the uh, iSpy team, which has uh, extensive experience with um, the adaptive platform design. Obviously, there also have been a number of challenges uh, to studies of COVID-19. Um, uh, these include uh, a lack of established funding, um, the extremely compressed timeline for many study activities. Uh, these include trial setup and launch, as well as patient enrollment and stratification. As we'll talk about today, data collection and analysis um, and some of the solutions that we've taken to uh, improve data collection and analysis. Obviously, a surge and pandemic uh, make for a challenging clinical trial enrollment as well. So one of the things that's very important about this study is that this is a trial that's trying to rapidly identify therapies. So we rely on our uh, data monitoring committee who meets every two weeks uh, and takes a look at the data every two weeks to uh, uh, put treatments uh, into the study as well as take therapies out of the study. Um, and so data completeness is very important for the uh, proper execution of the trial. Uh, we monitor this very closely and you can see here that uh, data completeness is um, very uh, good. Uh, it's 97%, for example, in the investigational arm, 94% in the observational arm at this data cut. Um, and uh, allows uh, us to really have robust data for the DMC to review. Um, there are some challenges to the current state of clinical trials data capture. Uh, the manual, as all of you know, the manual reentry of data from the electronic health record in the clinical trial system database is not only inefficient and burdensome, but can be prone to transcription errors. Um, and it's estimated that 30 to 40% of clinical trial costs and result reporting delays are associated with data management and data resolution issues. And notably, I'd like to say that I think data capture can be particularly challenging at community hospitals where there's less research infrastructure, um, as well as during sort of the surge that we've described for COVID. And I think these are important considerations because obviously community hospitals are a critical part of clinical trials and allow us to enroll a much more diverse and broad spectra, uh, spectrum of the population. So what is OneSource? OneSource is essentially a secure one way to automatically pull lab and medication and demographic data from the electronic health record uh, into the clinical trials database. So here you can see a picture of a representative EHR, and you can see on the right our ISPY COVID uh, clinical trials database system, which is an open clinica-based system. And uh, basically uh, the uh, OneSource solution allows the patients uh, uh, FHIR ID to be linked to the study ID, and, the, and as you'll see over the next few slides, it makes for a very smooth and efficient transfer of data that is 100% accurate. We've been able to, for example, estimate the data efficiencies that occur um, using one source. So for example, um, uh, there's data lab entry on the left for patients who are enrolled in a clinical trial. Um, let's say that each subject has 20 labs daily for five patients. It's estimated that this is about 15 times faster. Um, when you're doing individual data on a daily basis for patients who are in the trial. Um, 
there's an even greater efficiency if you look at batch data entry, for example, for observational subjects where you're catching up on data. Here you can see that um, 40 hours of sort of data entry can be reduced to a matter of minutes um, uh, with the ability to pull this data. And perhaps just as importantly as the time uh, that is saved is the accuracy of the data. The data is 100% accurate since it comes directly from the source. Oh, so sorry. So I'm going to show you in the next few slides um, some of the uh, integrated interfaces. So this is actually my view of Epic. I've uh, taken out all of the patient uh, information here. And what you can see is that I can uh, nicely put uh, one source into my uh, browser bar so it shows up next to results, notes, and orders because I'm looking at a clinical trials patient. If I click the one source button, it launches me directly into the open clinical record for that subject. If I miss click on a patient who's not enrolled in the trial, it tells me that there's no open clinical data for that individual. I can then sort of see all of the open clinica database for this patient, including some graphical representations that aren't available to me in the in the uh, actual uh, data in the actual um, clinical trials database. For example, this is a graph of uh, COVID scale um, uh, over time for an individual participant in the study. You can see they started at a level five and fortunately progressed to both the seven and six. Similarly, I can launch all of the forms. Um, uh, within uh, the Open Clinica database, not only the lab tabs and the medical medication tabs from the electronic health record, which you'll see in the next few slides, but also a number of other tabs, including um, all of the other study records that I might need to complete on this patient. For, if I, for example, want to uh, pull in labs, I simply um, can present the uh, interface with the date range for the dates that I want to pull the labs, um, click on the button, and the labs from the EHR can get pulled automatically into the Open Clinic database through one source. And similarly, uh, medications uh, can be obtained from the electronic health record uh, in the same way um, and uh, updated in Open Clinic. The implementation roadmap for this um, uh, for one source can actually be quite rapid now that many of the uh, bugs have been worked out. You can see here this is sort of a timeline. It can be as short as three weeks uh, if all the right uh, pieces are in place. Um, as of now, we have uh, implemented one source in seven of our clinical trial center and we've had excellent feedback. In particular, I would say for some of the community partner hospitals where the research infrastructure is a little bit more limited, it's really allowed them to be sure that their data capture is complete and efficient. Finally, just a couple of important features about Open Clinica. So as I've mentioned, Open Clinica can only be launched for a single patient at a time after the patient record is up and active in the EHR. So there's no bulk import or access to patient EHR data. And if a patient isn't linked to the EHR, then, um, sorry, if a patient's not linked to uh, the clinical trial, then that patient's data cannot be imported into Open Clinica. So that is another way that error is reduced. Uh, access to the one source application can be limited to, for example, a specific department, critical care medicine, or a specific set of users. So this is not something that everybody in the organization has access to. And finally, any pull of the patient's data from the electronic health record has to be initiated by an authenticated end user of the EHR. So it's really fundamentally no different than copying the data, but it's easier and more accurate um, and much uh, more rapid, as you've seen. So I'll stop there and look forward to the panel discussion. We would love to encourage uh, people to come ask questions. We have one great question now. Um, so Esteban, I know you mentioned, you answered it a little bit in the chat, but I'm going to put it out there for you. Um, Dr. Bouchard, now that your work has suggested a wake-up call, how do you recommend next-generation asthma innovators and in the FDA address the racial ethnicity differences observed in your studies? And I, frankly, I'm just going to add a little bit more to this. like. This should be applied to all medications and not just asthma. Yes. So ideally you are the trailblazer that then dictates policy for all medications. Well, in 1993, Congress implemented a law um, requiring the inclusion of women and minorities in all clinical NIH funded clinical research. The law just didn't have any teeth and the NIH has blatantly ignored it. Um, and um, we have published that um, in several publications. And I think that we, sh the NIH should just adhere to the law. You know, early on when we did clinical trials of cardiovascular disease and outcomes, we only studied white old men. And it wasn't until women 
got involved at the design phase to the Women's Health Initiative that we started including women. And we, we as a medical society, realized that women behave and respond differently for and present differently for uh, myocardial events or heart attacks. And it wasn't until then that we realized that dosing needs to change. The clinical presentation uh, is different. Uh, women, when they have a heart attack, tend to present with nausea, vomiting, and diaphoresis, and that cool, clammy feeling, uh, whereas men tend to be a little melodramatic and have, you know, the Sanford and Sons, I'm coming, you know, chest pain. And, and how many women um, were declined in the ER when they presented was uh, atrocious. And uh, there have been a lot of rewritings by the FDA for drugs like Ambien was re repurposed for dosing based on gender or sex. And we need to do that. We need to do that for all medications. And I point out asthma because this drug that came out works. It works really well. But blood parameters differ by race. And if you don't qualify by blood parameters, you the insurance companies won't pay. And in a New England Journal editorial in December 10th that I just sent to Lawrence Lynn, if you can't qualify, it costs $47,000 a year for this drug, which is more than the average minimum wage for most Americans. I'll leave it at that. All right, my and, next. Oh, and maybe ahead. I can jump in yeah, and just great. also um, add to what Esteban just mentioned. And I'll you know, more specifically from an FDA perspective, I think one of the areas that, you know, I definitely want to make sure that we highlight when we think about diversity in clinical trials, and of course, we've done work with Esteban, um, and we appreciate the opportunity to work with him through the CIRCES. Um, you know, from an FDA perspective, we have are committed to and have continued to work to advance diversity in clinical trials. And of course, the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity, we focus on racial and ethnic minority participation in clinical trials. And our agency has, uh, we've hosted meetings, we've developed tools, we've issued guidance documents with our most recent guidance document being the November 2020 Enhancing the Diversity of Clinical Trials, um, Eligibility Criteria, Enrollment Practices and Trial Design. So um, we are continuously working to advance diversity in clinical trials, um, including through our research efforts. So for example, um, the CIRCE project that we did with Esteban. I think another thing that's important to highlight is um, our agency also has the Drug Trial Snapshots Program. And that is an area where um, it provides consumers with information about those that participated in clinical trials that supported uh, FDA approval of original biologics, new molecular entities. This is a program that is led by the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Um, they also had uh, recently released their five-year summary and analysis of clinical trial participation and demographics. And I'll just briefly mention from that five-year data that we have from 2015 to 2019, and specifically looking at it from a U.S. perspective, we had about 16% Black or African-American participation, 2% Asian, about 1% American Indian or Alaska Native, about 15% Hispanic or Latino. So I just want to highlight there are a lot of tools and resources and information that our agency puts out there, especially in the space of diversity in clinical trials. Um, our office also has our ongoing public education and outreach campaign. It's an effort where we're continuously working to um, raise awareness, provide education, and overcome some of those barriers to participating in clinical trials. So just wanted to highlight that because those are other efforts that we continue to work to advance in addition to our research efforts. And I would, I would like to add one thing. Please. Um, since the George Floyd movement, there has been a political correctness in the United States and many social epidemiologists, and um, I consider myself liberal, but liberals have jumped on to try to advocate that we should remove race and ethnicity from all clinical and biomedical research. So I just sent Lawrence an editorial that we published last January 6th. You might've missed it because of the insurrection, um, advocating that we need, we as a medical and clinical and scientific society need to include race, ethnicity, but we have these new tools, genetic ancestry, which you have perfected, that we sh should include into clinical algorithms. And it's an empirical question. What is better, race, ethnicity, 
or genetic ancestry or a combination of the two. But we strongly advocate that we should not have a race blind approach to medicine and clinical decision making. Well, that, wow, that was that's like my dream question, and so I could I could dominate the panel just for the next hour on this alone. Um, so I'm, I'll put it back to all of you because it's it's one of my um, it's one of the interesting discoveries. One of the most interesting aspects of 23andMe is that we started it really as um, as a health company, and I feel like we we inadvertently or you know whether we want to or not, we've been pulled into the discussion on race. Mm -hmm. And the most surprising thing to me is how much people do not necessarily know. What they look like like i can look on this call and i can make gross assumptions about everybody and medicine is really one of the few places where it's okay to racial, racially profile someone but we've learned for instance that 20 percent of our customers who um, find out that they are brsa positive and one of the common ashkenazi variants never knew that they had ashkenazi ancestry mm -hmm. so right there all those individuals never would have qualified for uh, reimbursement, they never would have necessarily known. And that's Uta Franke published that paper also. Um, so I, I looked at all of you as to like, that is actually, I have two really questions. Like genetics is, is I think a really interesting opportunity to actually have that be part of all of clinical research because that actually helps define and necessarily bring in some of that diversity. Um, and secondly, on a slightly separate topic, one thing that I have found is when you tell individuals like your paper, Esteban, like when you talk about the outrage of how people are not included or that there are medications that don't respond to them, there is outrage. And then at the same time, it's actually quite hard to recruit sometimes, um, you know, underrepresented populations into studies. So one thing I look at and I am quite focused on is that representation matters. And so having PIs yeah. who are all white males is not going to encourage others to step in. So I look at also at the agency and at all of the groups, you have to have representation at the top as PIs in order to recruit people to come in. So again, my first questions for you is really about how do you actually get genetics more and more into studies? And then secondly, should there be a mandate to have representation among PIs in order to bring people in because no one's going to come into a study unless they actually see that representation at the top? I agree. Um, the mandates are difficult to enforce or require. And if we look at the University of California, we cannot include include race as a decision maker for who gets in. Um, but um, despite that, UCSF has had the highest number of minority recruits uh, for the medical school in the entire history since 1887. Uh, so there are ways around it. But I agree with you. Um, it, it goes the same for women. If, if you have all white, all men recruiting, you're not going to get women involved. It's, it's, it's a no duh experience. So I'll just add really quickly. I, I want to, of course, um, keep it open so the other panelists can weigh in. The one thing that I'll just say, of course, and Esteban knows this, we think it's really important for us to support um, advancing our minority investigators. Um, and another area that we think is critically important is really getting out to the community and make sure that we're also engaging community clinicians and research. Um, so, you know, from being able to make sure that we have opportunities and uh, ways that we can continue to train minority investigators, making sure that they have mentors, making sure that um, they're actually able to um, be able to uh, be participating and able to um, have the opportunities to serve as a PI, but also making sure that we're getting to the community and community clinicians as well. So Sharday, as a, a follow-up to that, uh, that question, there's a, uh, or your, your comments there, there's a question uh, from Amy Lee asking uh, about uh, what resources the FDA might have for, uh, for, 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 uh, for startups that are seeking to address uh, health disparities? So we have a, a wide range of resources on our web, so website, which is fda.gov forward slash health equity. Um, from the resources that we have available related to diversity and clinical trials, I know sometimes we hear a lot of times from PIs about what are just some resources we have available that are also available in multiple languages. Um, an area that for us is really important is making sure that we have information in multiple languages. So for example, um, info relate, information related to what is a clinical trial. We have that information, we have resources, we have educational materials, videos, 
Um, our agency also has, for example, an investigators course that they do each year. So there are a lot of resources available on FDA's website, including um, some of our culturally and linguistically tailored resources directly on OMHHE's webpage. And I'm happy to provide that in the chat. So just as uh, just as a follow up, I have a question that popped up that, that sort of intrigues me and I think is connected uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> to, to what Kathleen and John are working on. So this is from Emily uh, Eagler. So, um, so since most historical databases lack equitable representation, um, you know, so do you all, I guess I'll direct this to both John and uh, Kathleen, um, have suggestions for how we can flag note limitations in existing data sets? Um, I don't have a direct answer of best practices for um, assessing data sets. Uh, right now, I think that's an important thing that we should think about and, and actually uh, do. What I would say is in addition, to it, you know, I mean, we have to figure out number one, um, you know, self-report versus perceived, um, you know, if, if, but I think there's also, when you look at heterogeneity within groups, uh, when you look at, you know, intersectionality, right? So if you look at, uh, you know, these can lead to like really small categories of, of people. So I think we also have to think about how do we harmonize across data sets um, to, generate large enough numbers so that we can study um, variations so that we don't lump, you know, everyone who's sort of categorized, like say, for example, um, Hispanics or, uh, or Latinx, that we treat them all sort of the same, uh, where they may have very different experiences. Um, you can make the, uh, the same case for many other groups uh, that we have to drill down to get into um, the heterogeneity, but we have to find ways to, to pool data across places so that we can get sufficient numbers. I don't know if I have that much to add to John's great answer to this question. I mean, I think for a lot of the work that we're doing, the key is really to make sure that uh, patients have access to the clinical trials, which means being out in community hospitals and engaging with the community on uh, the research that we're doing so that they feel like they're an active and engaged part and they understand um, what we're doing. So as we start to think about the, uh, you know, think about that information and data acquisition and things like that, and we've already mentioned this issue of mandates, um, so there's a question in in the uh, chat, uh, Sharde, sort of asking, do we are we expecting any uh, any new uh, mandates from the uh, for, you know through the FDA or NIH? So I, I mentioned the guidance document that our agency uh, released back in November 2020. Um, of course, we have issued other guidance documents that support diversity in clinical trials. We have our 2016 collection of race and ethnicity data and clinical trials guidance, for example. Um, so, you know, through our guidance documents and through even, for example, the campaign that I mentioned that our office has, we continue to work um, to uh, provide information, to raise awareness, to advance diversity in clinical trials. So. Uh, the resources that we have available, um, I, I highlighted those. And we, again, it's an area that we, it's a priority, especially for the Office of Minority Health and Health Equity. Um, and we are continuously working to find ways to advance diversity in clinical trials from even the research that we fund, the outreach and communication um, mechanisms that we have, as well as the guidance documents that our agency has, um, has uh, issued, including public meetings um, that we've hosted and the other thing that I'll mention, um, and I know some of you may even be familiar with it, we also have broad stakeholder engagement activities. So for example, um, the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative has a diversity project, um, and that's an area where we are engaged. So there are a lot of different broad stakeholder efforts as well um, that are also working within the space um, and to continue the momentum and continue to advance um, racial and ethnic minority participation in clinical trials, as well as of other diverse populations. Interesting. I'm actually going to throw another question out there to all of you. Um, there's a lot of innovation happening right now in clinical trials, specifically because of the you know, stay at home and COVID. So decentralized clinical trials are certainly all the rage. I do wonder whether or not that is going to have an influence and make it easier for us to have diversity in clinical studies. So those types of things could absolutely take off if there's support from the various agencies and from, from um, you know, well-established PIs. I'm curious whether or not some of that innovation could actually help. Well, it's, it's helped with uh, recruitment of patients for COVID trials. Um, I don't know if you recall, but from the get-go, uh, 
all the trials were extremely biased towards populations of European origin, populations that were easy to recruit. And once the NIH changed the formula for uh, clinical trials, uh, we, we realized that, oh my God, COVID has tremendous racial and ethnic disparities. Uh, and work done at UCSF demonstrated within our own mission district, which is a primarily Latino district, is about 40% white, but 99% of the COVID cases were amongst Latinos. And that was not due to genetics, it was due to uh, social factors, work, job position and so forth, and socioeconomic status. So I'm very grateful that the NIH has changed, uh, at least for COVID. Uh, I, I think it's incumbent on the NIH to do more work. I, I don't, I know that this is partly the FDA's responsibility, but it's largely the NIH's responsibility since they, they're the publicly funded, taxpayer funded uh, primary engine for all basic and early research going on in the United States. So and I'll just add to, to what really quickly, what Esteban mentioned. I, I mean, I do think that decentralized clinical trials gives us that opportunity, another opportunity to extend to and reach populations um, that we may have challenges in reaching. And, uh, you know, so I definitely think that those types of um, being innovative and thinking about ways that we can extend our reach, is very important. So, so, so Christine, Christina Chardet, I wonder if you guys, uh, I've heard a little bit about uh, a language access program that, that's run out of the Office of, uh, of Minority Health and Equity. Could, could either of you tell us more about that? Sure, I, I can start and Christine can jump in. Um, it's an area, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier on where um, across our outreach and communication program, we have our language access program. It's really an opportunity for us to provide a flexible means for our centers and offices to acquire translation services. Um, we of course have a priority to make sure that we're able to reach our diverse consumers and patients and stakeholders. And one of the priorities there is making sure that we're providing information in multiple languages. Um, across all of the resources that we develop, whether it be um, our health education materials to other resources we have, we always work to make sure that we're providing those in multiple languages um, and that we are really engaging as broadly as we can. And um, I, the one piece that I'll just highlight here that I think also ties back to our work with CIRCES and our research efforts as well and our even broader research efforts um, is that when we think about our language access program, we're also making sure that we aren't, that we're not assuming, that we're not making assumptions. We wanna make sure that we are actually working um, with our uh, patient communities, having listening sessions, focus groups, and conducting uh, formative research that helps us to truly understand diverse patient perspectives, preferences, and unmet needs, including those language access needs. Okay, I think we're almost at time, so I can just wrap up. Um, one, it was an absolute um, privilege to be part of this session because it is something that I am very passionate about, but also as somebody who runs a company that has over 12 million people, I just want to express the voice of the individual that people really care and they would like to see this kind of change. And that when it's when there's more transparency from all of their investigators or for them, the government and various agencies about some of these inequities, people actually really will step up. People don't wanna be taking medications that don't work for them. So I do think again, like one thing I've always thought about, especially with 23andMe is the opportunity for everyone here to actually surface some of these issues to the broad public as an opportunity for us to level the playing field for everybody. So I do think that there's a real opportunity to have better healthcare for everybody and representation for everybody. So I'm incredibly optimistic and optimistic hearing everyone's talks because I think the first step is really surfacing some of the issues and surfacing some of the potential solutions. So thank you to everyone.